All right, I'm recording here, and this right. is another Headless Way Zoom meeting. And uh, we have no uh, particular program here, except we're celebrating who we are through the Headless Way. And I think that I will just uh, get each of you to introduce yourselves and perhaps how you came to seeing or something about you and seeing where you're up with it. And we've got an hour. So we're just hanging out together as normal. So Matthew, would you like to start? Sure. My name is Matthew <coughs> and I live in Oregon. And uh, I came to this uh, being here. I have no idea how I just was at the gym working out one time and saw Buddha at the gas pump uh, website and scrolled to the very bottom and hit. And there was Richard talking and I thought, it sounds interesting. And so uh, here I am about two years later. Other than that, I have no idea. All right. Thank you. Catherine? Um, I'm also in Oregon, and um, I learned about this practice um, just this year. I went to the uh, American Gathering. I um, didn't really know too much about the practice um, until then, but it was really, um, I found it very um, transformative for my life in that I don't think I realized how self-conscious I was, you know, sort of when you, when you're in a state of consciousness, that's just sort of normal. And since then I've realized I was very constricted and bound by, um, by that. And it's a sort of um, introversion or shyness. And so, um, this practice has helped me to, um, not be as self-conscious, to be uh, more um, open and open to creativity and um, not as limited in terms of um, that. <laughs> um, and because it's, um, what the seeing is, is very liberating. It's um, seeing self in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Alice, we're in Oregon. We're staying in Oregon. <laughs> we are. Hi. Um, I came through Brighton Bush as well, seeing Headless Way workshop in a catalog. What a treat. Met Catherine there, Matthew there, Richard there. And now these hangouts are a sheer joy. Um, and headlessness... Oh, I don't know. I, I, we, we, I just wrote down something that I think Colm said um, in, an hour ago. I thought this is so beautiful. He said, the opening is headlessness. And what, rather than there is some place we have to go and open the door and then headlessness is on the other side. And anyhow, so... Um, so this is just perfect. These hangouts are just perfect for me. <laughs> Thank you. Bill? Hi, I'm Bill. I'm in Hawaii. And I've been interested in headlessness on and off for a long time, about 20 years or more. I went to a workshop with Douglas Harding long ago. And uh, it's, it appeals to me. One reason is that uh, it's very simple yet very profound. And you can use it anytime. And it's uh, very, it's fun. It's funny. And it's, it's a pleasure to, to uh, use this practice. And uh, I enjoy these hangouts. They're very useful. A lot of fun, too. Great meeting people every week that I've never met in person, but I feel like I know them online, at least. And... Uh, Welcome to the meeting, everyone. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, hi, I'm Jeff. This is my international YouTube debut, so welcome to all. Um, I chose the Headless Way because it is a, an extremely practical, structured, and unstructured way to do things. It's sort of like a buffet of spiritual practices in which you can go through the exercises 
regardless of your background. And you can test them and see what you get. So that's why I like the headless play. That's it. Thank you. All right, uh, Wouter. Hi, I'm uh, here in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and um, yeah, I heard of uh, headless uh, for a few years, but only last year, September, went to a workshop in Amsterdam with Richard and. Yeah, since then I enjoy really the hangouts and the experiments. It's very practical. It's not um, new agey or uh, it's very experimental. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. And the thing is that I can share what I recognize. Um, and I feel that, yeah, a lot of people... Um, yeah, whatever headless is for everybody, uh, it's very nice to share it in in a, in a way. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, hi, my name is Tom. I'm in the Philadelphia area, and I came across headlessness maybe four to five years ago from reading Douglas's uh, work. So although I've been on uh, different uh, spiritual paths, and this seem to make sense of them, uh, even though it, it, at least for me, it kind of turns the world uh, upside down in some ways. And Douglas always points to the fact that when we look at ourselves, we, we are upside down, and our feet are on top. Spatial relationships uh, go topsy-turvy like, like many things, but uh, it feels to me uh, that it's correct in certain ways. It's just uh, the way the way this existence situation uh, is for me. So I, I find that extremely helpful and, uh, and all the tools that go along with it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Sequoia? Yes, my name is Sequoia and um, I live in Oregon also and um, been aware of my headless nature now for about three years. And I participate in all of the hangouts that I'm possibly able. It, the experience of headlessness and being aware of my headless nature has completely shifted my life also. And um, for me, I'm acutely aware that, that it's not a spiritual path. It's just what is given. And it's how how things actually are and it's beyond anything that that could be identified or labeled as spiritual so it's nice to be here great thank you Sequoia and Carter hi I'm Carter and I live in Los Angeles and uh, I guess I do see uh, headless as a spiritual path and Mine started in AA some 40 years ago when I was in suicidal alcoholism and it started a search that ended up uh, with uh, going to a whole lot of uh, Buddhist retreats and things and, uh, and uh, working through all these stages and spending thousands of hours meditating and working and working and working and finally getting to this big long retreat where we were supposed to wake up when the guru clapped his hands and none of the 80 of us that I noticed really did wake up. And, but it still, it, it, it brought me some sense of peace. And, but then I got into the non-dual path and, and doing a look there. And this simple thing, actually, it was slightly before this, I encountered a fellow named Greg Good but it was very similar to the headless way of, of just saying, what do you see when you're pointing backwards instead of out there? And all of a sudden, I had this experience now of, of, of being aware of, of, of not 
being a thing of not being Carter anymore, but doing everything. And, and I realized that's what that guy was carrying. <laughs> and I'd gone to all these retreats and whatever. That was the experience that it was that simple. Just instead of pointing out there, pointing in here. Uh, and even though, you know, I'm a searcher and I've, I searched around for, for some time in some other places over the last few years, I came back to especially these headless hangouts because there's just such a simple way to immediately when I'm, when I'm getting, uh, when I realize that I'm not awake, I can just become awake immediately by just noticing uh what's the what noticing the uh what's uh noticing <laughs> so i love this way and i love these hangouts and i honor richard for having kept this uh going and allowing us to participate worldwide thank you thank you and robert you you just turned up someone else from oregon <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Are you Oregon? Uh, oh no, I'm uh, up by Seattle. Oh, okay. all right. We've north. just been introducing ourselves, so if you just want to do that. Oh sure. Um, well, I'm uh, I'm fairly new to the to this headless way, and uh, it it really came together for me in July at the American gathering, but previous to that, through um, some of the reading of Douglas and um, finally getting around to trying some of the experiments and, and really um, having that experience, that O oh experience. Uh, and it really kind of caught me by surprise the first time. I, I didn't know what I was expecting, but uh, there was definitely something. And so that was enough to, uh, to keep me going. And, and I'm, I'm really, uh, glad that I have. It's it's been a great help to me, and uh, I look forward to more. These hangouts are a great help to me. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. So the experience of headlessness is just noticing that you don't see your own head, your own face, right where you are. And of course, we all see ours on the screen. So it's just being uh, just. It's being capacity, aware capacity for everything going on. Uh, so, uh, wonderful. And you never have to go to the hairdresser again. That's also very nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was thinking what Matthew said at the last hangout about expectations getting in the way of seeing who we are. And I I don't experience them getting in the way. I I think it's because I when I point there I'm not expecting a particular experience. So maybe, you know, in other words, the expectation, if I point, you know, I will be aware of this headless nature. That, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to be a problem. If I try, if I, I can have expectations of other people seeing that, but somehow, I don't know, the, it's not the same kind of thing as the expectations that this meditation now when I'm sitting here is going to make me calm or something like that. So I haven't felt that expectations got in the way. I wondered what other people felt about that. I was just thinking that uh, if I say that if I'm going to point and look, I expect to see who I really am. And it's, pr it's probably just about the one thing that every time I do it, <laughs> my expectations are fulfilled. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> I do see. Um, <laughs> I know, I, I know, I know. That's why, I mean, they don't, they don't give me something false. They don't get in the way. Satisfaction guaranteed. <laughs> Satisfaction guaranteed. 
I was saying it more from like the small eye when the small eye, so to speak, has the expectation. You know, if I come to a hangout expecting to feel better, say about the election, or if I come to the hangout expecting to get rid of a headache, or if I, you know, if there's an annoyance and I come to the hangout with the expectation of not being annoyed, but yeah, the openness, the, the, the screen, so to speak, is always there. So what's on it comes and goes. Mm. I was also thinking about that expectation of enlightenment. So we have kind of this idea of what, you know, enlightenment would be ever bliss, constant bliss and happiness. And, um, and I think that can be very limiting as well in the way that, um, you know, that um, preventing us from seeing reality as it is and being okay and accepting that it is like this, this is what, this is how it is. Cause it, that ex, you know, of course it would never be pure bliss, you know, there's room for everything. Right. So that's what I was thinking about that expectation about enlightenment that can be very limiting at times. It's so easy to get an overblown impression of what enlightenment is as this special state for a few people and most of us are not in it. And uh, so we seek out people who are in it. Hopefully, you know, somehow we'll get infected or, you know, uh, but uh, when you see who you really are and you see this open space, you see that it is, uh, it's not a special state and that states of mind come and go in it. And uh, you're seeing you've got one open eye, single eye. The only eye you experience is yours. Everything is is in it and this is totally natural and for everyone we're all looking out of this so this is immediately uh, equalizing and uh, doesn't uh, uh, it, it's not being in a special state of mind yeah i i hear some um people speak of headlessness as a tool you know, as they use it for things. But it's, for me, through my experience, it's just what is. It, um, it's what's given in any moment. And it's not a tool, I, you know, to be used, you know, to make things better or to do things differently. Um, it's just the natural um, expression. Yeah. Yeah, headlessness is bigger than a tool because when I look here, I, I'm i aware of everything and uh, even expectations as big as they are aren't, aren't don't cover the whole thing is here. It's, there's everything here. Mm-hmm. We're so conditioned to see, to expect the world to be out there. Um, and uh, so there is getting past the expectation when I see that it's, it's here. Mm. Visually, it looks like it's on my shoulders to a certain extent. It's not really on my shoulders. Yeah, the, the, expectation, is that, the expectation is in that way, where when I look this way, I get what's out there plus what's in here. So it's everything. <laughs> Yes, uh, Tom, this idea that the world is out there and you're in here and there's a distance between you. Uh, When you see who you are, you're this open, this single eye that fades out all the way into consciousness or something. You know, it's not out there. Everything is within you. Uh, Gosh. I would love it if somebody did an experiment. So that. Well, what about you doing one, Carter? Not yet. Unlike Jeff, I'm shy. In that way. Catherine. Okay. Um. Uh, this will be a pointing experiment, and um, 
point at something um, out in the distance of your viewpoint from wherever you are. Um, so I'm just going to jump in and say, if the, whoever's watching this, you could join us, join, follow along with us. All right, go for it, Catherine. Okay. So then, um, and in, in this viewpoint, you can, um, you know, pick an object and, and look at the object and um, does the object have shape and does it have size? Um, notice if it has a, notice a texture, is there a texture to the object? And it may be helpful to notice your finger pointing at the object in that view. And then next, find something closer, perhaps your foot. Um, point to your foot and notice, does it have a size? Is there, is there a shape? Is there a texture? Is there a color? Perhaps um, notice the color of the object called a foot that we call a foot or notice um, what might be on it. Is there a shoe on the foot? <laughs> notice the characteristics of what you're pointing at. And then next, find something closer. Uh, point at your knee and notice this object and notice the perception of distance and color. Does it have a color? Does it have a shape? And then next, with your pointer, point this direction, pointing back at the place that you're viewing from. And as you're doing this, notice the place that you're viewing from and notice is there, ask yourself if there's a question, is there a texture? Is there a shape? Is there a color? And notice this place that you're viewing from and what, what it is here, what do you see here? And there's an additional component for this experiment. You can take this pointer and point out again into the distance and with the other finger point back to the place you're viewing from. So there can be a dual attention from the place that you're viewing from and an object, objects out in the distance as well so that um, there's an inward and external view in this, this way, this dual attention. And there's more to this experiment. I don't know if somebody else would like to build on this in terms of once you noticed this viewpoint, um, we could do the single eye. Does somebody want to do a single eye experiment? Good idea. I'd like just like to say, first notice how the pointing in that direction goes with pointing in this direction, in that both your experience, you can experience what you see out there without noticing there's nothing to see this way. And if you just look at this way, you don't notice what's going on out there. So there's both experiences happen at the same time. You can't see the space without seeing something in it. Right. And I would, I like to ask myself, where's the boundary? It's kind of a, you know, when I do that, I, I sort of go, where, where's the boundary? And I just like to ponder it. I think, see if I can find a boundary. Can you find one? Not yet. <laughs> 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 no. No. I can't. <laughs> but for me, uh, noticing that out there, it's all things, what we call things, you know, as Catherine described them with colors and shape. And this way, we're talking about no thing. And it's easy to, to confuse them because they are one and the same in a way. But no thing, not being a thing, it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, but it's the, it's the space. It's the it's where all the things are appearing. 
yes. in right here. Nothing is nothing is perfectly clear. It's empty. It has all the room it needs for whatever's out there. It's boundless, pure. And uh, the the fact is, a wonderful fact is, this is a non-verbal experience. And you can't get it wrong. You can't see your head. Instead, you see the world. And the fact that it's non-verbal attention means that we can think about it in different ways and we can describe it in different ways and we can react and respond in different ways. And each of us will do. Each of us will describe it in different ways. But because we've got the experience, we're not trying to fit, you know, not trying to get what someone else is describing. We've got the experience and then we express it in our own way and we accept everyone else's expression as a unique expression. So we have many voices here in one consciousness, many views out from one openness. And you experience one view out, one single eye, and you hear about all the others from this mysterious consciousness. Fantastic. Yeah. And because every view out is unique, it's uniquely precious and important. Yeah, well said, yes. And one of the things that just, uh, when you're pointing back at that open, empty space that, as Tom said, that contains everything, it's the container of everything, and yet it's open and empty, that if you close your eyes... And I, I would encourage people to do that, to just close their eyes. Then it can contain things like memories, like the image of the Eiffel Tower can come up and it's containing that image of the Eiffel Tower. And it contain things like uh, the image of your mother's face or the sound of her voice. And it contained things like, as we did in the experiment yesterday, the words T-R-U-M-P, Trump. And it's still unaffected. It's just containing that. So this infinite open space is containing everything and totally unaffected by it. And if you keep... Are you finished, Carter, or not? Yeah, I'm finished. So keep your eyes closed just for a moment and be aware that this space, this capacity, is not dependent on vision. And you can hear the sounds coming and going in this silence. And you're aware of uh, body sensations arising and changing in this capacity here. And thoughts and feelings like you were saying, Carter. Uh, and uh, if you open your eyes now, the thoughts and feelings are still going on, but they don't, they're not central. They're part of the view out. The world is clothed in thought and feeling and sensation. Uh, not dependent on vision. Vision is fantastic because it's so easy, it's such an easy way of communicating. But it applies to all the senses. I was going to add to that. Um... I have I have some kids downstairs and my wife is cooking, so there will be noises coming in and out of the void, but it's just what it is. I was going to add um, that a trap for me has always been when people, when I talk about headlessness, they'll say, well, you know, I can, I have a head. I could feel my head. I could feel this thing, right? And so just a real simple experiment, if we um, close our eyes, And then we focus on, for me, if your uh, lips are together, you can feel the sensation of these things called lips. And just focus on those vibrations. And then focus on the vibrations of this thing called your head that you say exists. Well, for me anyway, notice the vibrations and then ask yourself, how big are they? Are they a solid fixed object? 
or do, do they blend with other things such as even sounds? Can you separate the vibration of this thing called the head from the sounds in the background? And does it have a color to it, this thing called a head? And with your eyes closed, can you tell how far this thing called the head is from, say, the sensation of your feet? Put your attention in one of your feet. And then go back to the sensation of your lips or a part of your head, your nose, wherever. And go ahead and try and see, is there a distinct line between the sensation of foot and the sensation of lips? Are they the size of a, um, say, a grape, these sensations? Or are they the size of perhaps uh, an automobile or truck? Now, with the eyes closed, listen to the sounds, whether it's the sounds of children's voices or my voice. Any voice, any sounds in your world? Where do these sounds exist? And do the sounds have a size? So thank you. Mm. You can open your eyes and thanks, Matthew. Keep playing. You're welcome. That was wonderful. Thank you. And truly, I I could not estimate a size. I could not estimate a shape or a distance or anything of this thing labeled as a head. anything that could be called a container there just wasn't it was wide open there's that thing we sometimes talk about when you look at two objects in the field of view say two of the heads here uh, you could say well one is about the same size as another or a bit bigger or a bit smaller uh, but when you look at the whole view how big is it? Well, you can't say because in the sense there isn't a second one to compare it with. You hear about the others, but you don't experience it. There's one view, one visual view, one field of sensation, and one field of thinking and feeling, one field of sound, all in this openness. So uh, how big, uh, the question is, uh, as Matthew was saying, how big are you? Well, you don't experience another directly to compare yourself with. You're the one. You don't have a size. You're not inside anything. And now the brilliant thing is that we're, you know, we we have this easy way in to uh, becoming aware of, of who we really are through the experiments. So we're all aware of it here. It's natural. It, it's it's nothing esoteric. You're noticing you can't see your head. You're looking out of openness. This is absolutely natural true for everyone and uh, we are coming together to share this our responses to this uh, uh, experience of, of one's own being wonderful I melted in uh, during the ex uh, Matthew's uh, experiment or how you call it uh, I melted into kind of ex abstract painting like I was completely like a screen like a, a painting and completely abstract 
So my my lips, my my the sounds, everything melted in a very abstract painting. I never felt that before. Very nice. And I would like to ask or say that in in regard of uh, what Sukoya said that. I understand very well that headless is not a tool, but in a way I do sometimes use it as a tool, as a reminder tool maybe, or as a, and, and I like that very much also because yeah, so it's, it's not so esoteric that you cannot grab it for sure. You cannot grab headless, but in a way the experiments and the, I do sometimes regard it as a tool, and I, I like that also. Mm. Well, it, back in the 70s, Douglas Harding, when he was inventing the experiment, late 60s and 70s, and then with all uh, his friends, we were making it up, making them up, exploring. And in 1972, he put the experiments that were developed at that point all together into what he called the toolkit for testing the incredible hypothesis. And the incredible hypothesis was a quotation from Tennyson, which was nearer is he, nearer is God than breathing, closer than hands and feet. And the experiments were uh, uh, tools. It was a toolkit to test out, what, are you what you look like? And they're very practical in that sense that perhaps you're saying, Valtteri, you can get a hold of them. You know, there's not some esoteric, uh, abstract thing you've got to try and understand. It's point and look. When you're driving, are you still or is the world, you know, are you moving or is the world moving? When you look at someone else, are you face to face or face to no face? This is very handleable, uh, very practical, physical. It's certainly a lot handier than and quicker to find than uh, when I took a uh, flight from uh, here at Los Angeles to Singapore and then to Delhi and then took this bus up the mountain for four hours of terrified driving to see the Dalai Lama and and hoping to have this somehow this open spacious experience and that didn't happen so later on in that same trip i flew to Kathmandu and took a, pl a plane to lukla and climbed up this mountain forever to get to the tengboshe monastery halfway up mount everest and it was a fabulous experience but still i didn't find that simple thing of that i can find <laughs> <laughs> but it made me really appreciate Douglas's experiments. <laughs> Much cheaper. A hell of a lot cheaper, yes. But it's so simple. As Sequoia says, it's like, well, well, can this be real spirituality? You know, it's like, gee, yes, it is, for me anyway. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. I think the experience, experiments really helped me to notice the direct experience of seeing, you know, I've noticed for me, um, it's very easy to go on autopilot and to navigate all through my things, a whole day, days, weeks, even on autopilot. Um, and we seem to have this capacity to do that. We seem to be built in a way that we can drive a car and think about something else completely. Um, but when I notice actual seeing, when I notice the characteristics of seeing, for example, that I can't see in my own head and that um, and these, these things, it, it brings me present to the moment. It brings me in touch with my direct experience of, of now, of this moment. And, and that way it's very, very helpful. Mm. Yes. Yeah, Catherine, that, uh, that's great because it's a great, you know, you can have that, um, like for people who are watching this video, you can, you can download the Headless Way app 
and that actually will help you along the way in understanding this. But it's also nice to just have your own version. So, for instance, I, what I do is if I'm having a negative emotion, some sort of tension or something um, that I feel, right? So for me, Catherine, that's what I use. So when I get that feeling, I go, whoop, stop. Do you, the easiest one for me is the pointing because that you can do anywhere. But there's the two-way pointing. There's several different exercises you can try. The, the whirling dervish one, which kind of, you know, that be careful on that one. Because <laughs> that's sort of a fun one. But it's, you have to spin around. That's a good exercise. But there's any exercises you can use and that will take you to some sort of setting or some sort of feeling that it's maybe different than your tension. You still have your tension, but you're in a different state of and really the only way to this to experience this is to try the exercises. And they're simple. You just go you can just go immediately to the internet to get an exercise, just go to the head this way. And um, you can, Richard Lang, you can look up his name too, to see videos while you're already seeing this video. You must have looked it up. So that's what I do. So, so if it's during the day and I have an uncomfortable emotion, I know, whoop, look for your spaciousness. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. You know, I find that there's a distinction between the experiments themselves and seeing in general. There's the experiments are specific to a certain time and place where I do them. But seeing is is a sense of infinity. It's infinite in that direction, and infinite in this direction. So it's it's somehow bigger than any single experiment can be. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Bill, I, that's the other thing I was curious about, what other people think about this. So you sort of have like a little, I, I don't want to use the term, well, I'll use a practice or a sort of set of things you do during the day, right? Where you, where you just do the experiment. Is that correct? Yeah, but I don't, I don't, it's, it's hard to describe. It just kind of happens on its own. Like I see with one eye, or I, or I'm walking and the, the house moves through me. I don't move through the house, or I don't drive on the road. The road goes through me. It just happens by itself. But can can you a little bit describe that, or anyone, Bill, uh, or Richard, about that thought that the world is? Um, I forgot what the thought is. I'm moving or no, I'm not moving. The world is yeah. moving. Okay, so so the idea is that the world is moving and I'm not moving. So I'm, you know, a little bit, okay, I'm okay on that exercise. But I, well, I just see what happens when you're walking through a doorway. The doorway gets bigger and bigger and all of a sudden it vanishes. Just like when you move your hands this way, after a point they don't, they vanish. It's hmm. the same way. And then when you're sitting in your car, the, the scenery comes up next to you and then vanishes into you. This can be so enjoyable. It, for me, walking through the woods, if you see this way, the, the trees will be rotating and everything is moving within you. It, it's not, not to give it too much significance, but it's, it's just enjoyable to see the mm. world that way. It's like being a kid again. Everything's very interesting and, and dancing. I think the hallmark of seeing is you're paying attention and you're looking uh, for yourself at the way things are given and you're not just taking on trust. Uh, and in a way, you're distinguishing between what others see you to be, which is a person walking through the still world and your experience and you're valuing your side of things as much as the external one and and you you're you're noticing how things are given like you say bill it's like having the eyes of a child it's fresh uh, you you see things that you edited out like 
as you're saying, the, uh, Tom, the, you know, the trees revolve, they dance, they pirouette. <laughs> I think the implications for humanity are pretty amazing as well, because, um, you know, as Douglas Harding talked about, when there's face to face, when we are identified with this physical appearance and with this identity, which uh, when we identify with this, there's always like a potential for conflict when people are interacting in that way of ego to ego or face to face. And when there's face to no face or even no face to no face. So then when we're um, not, we're not identified with this, um, with, with a, um, our physical appearance and um, these things, I am, you know, an American or I am this, I am that when we're not, identified with these things, then we're, we're very free and liberated and, and we can interact in a way that is not creating conflict. So the implications for humanity, I think, are amazing. It's almost as if the only way humanity can maybe continue to coexist would be in, in this way, in, in, this, um, in this way of um, self um, identifying self um, in a more open way. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's particularly useful right now, thinking about Donald Trump. So I look at Donald Trump on TV and I think, okay, and, and somehow I am he and he is me. And uh, that's an interesting problem to work through. Mm. I, now, sometimes when I'm watching this video, it's like I'm becoming all of the faces I'm seeing mm -hmm. and contained in my one face. In yeah. fact, Bill, you just you're you're starting to talk about seeing the doorway pass through me. I saw that whole trip to India and whatnot almost in a flash of it's just coming through me. I was thinking, gee, I'd like to go back there, but then I can almost revisit it just in my own imagination. And, and it's just, a, it's just, it just happens in this one space. And uh, mm. I'm still working on the Trump thing. <laughs> yeah, me yes, he is me. He's, he's in this huge open world that is open space. He's one of the, one of the arisings that are happening out there, you know, along with the, you know, the, in the last day or a few days, you know, thousands, even millions of people have been born and died. That, Yeah. What a mystery. Wow. It is. And it's a beautiful, delightful, wonderful, fabulous mystery. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having a thought about how, uh, you know, headlessness doesn't mean a feeling. It doesn't mean a state of mind of bliss because I just had a memory come up of, uh, I went surfing one time and this, to get down to the beach, I had to walk through a trail and there was a dead seal, uh, sea lion carcass on this drain pipe half de decomposed and um it's it just stunk for the huge stench but i had to walk past this area to get down to the beach and i remember as i was walking down like the mind was thinking oh my god you know this isn't right you shouldn't if you're in a state of blood <laughs> if you're in a state of bliss or whatever you shouldn't be experiencing this this is horrible right it just mined it all this chatter. And then I went surfing and I couldn't smell it. It was a beautiful surf. And then I came back and I smelled the stench again. Right. And so it's all, it's all as Rupert Spiro always talked about. It's just the screen doesn't change. Mm. This is who we are, so to speak, metaphorically is the screen, but the stench and this, and this beautiful ocean in which I was surfing, they're both, mm. they're both, they coexist, yeah. Mm. Yeah, living in this world, there's got to be 
good and bad and pleasant and unpleasant, all these dualities. It's the only way it, you can have a world is to have both. Yes. And so to experience these polarities and, uh, you know, the ocean and the carcass and all the other variations of those polarities, you're not doing it wrong. That's the nature of the, the experience. But r where you are is this open space that is not left or right or up or down or good or bad. Uh, so... Uh, Include that in your awareness and find out how that affects you in this uh, wonderful but sometimes terrifying life. <laughs> Letting go of resistance, right? Dropping the barriers. I've previous to this. Uh, for probably most of my life, uh, I had a real barrier as a sense of personal space that I, uh, I felt a real tension when anybody crossed that barrier and mm. got too close. But this is really, I would say, drop that barrier. Mm. I don't feel that way anymore. Mm. And for that, I'm really grateful. Mm. There's no... Uh Dividing line between the nothing and the something? Exactly. And you're not mm. in a box? Sorry, Sequoia. Well, I was just going to say, and things are coming and going in it all the time. Um, that's what Matthew's um, story reminded me, is that things are just coming and going, and and in this wide open space all the time. And how do you think awareness of that wide open space helps you cope with the fact that things are coming and going? Because some things we want to go, but other things we don't want to go. How does it help you, Sequoia? Um, I, I think it just gives me some distance and for allowing, for allowing those things that come to come and to allowing those things to go to go. And, and this, I, I can draw back to um, my experience that I've had, that I've shared on a number of hangouts about um, my um, pet dog who passed and my struggle in the past with um, grief and loss and after becoming aware of my headless nature, how that process was so much more expedited. And it just gave me the distance necessary to, to be able to allow for that coming and going. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We're coming to the end of this session. Any reflections on uh, just being together for this hour before we finish? Yes, my reflection is I've had feelings of happiness <laughs> through the <laughs> hours. Kind of flowing, just nice feelings of happiness. Gratitude, and I, I would attach that onto what Jeff said. Absolute gratitude for for this group, for all of you, for sharing your experiences and just being here. It's amazingly helpful. Thank you. Strength and hope. <laughs> and I think for me, my final thoughts are is that that um, the closeness that I share with everyone, even though my face isn't visual, <laughs> um, being here with everyone and the closeness of a sense of family that's developed over time and is just wonderful. I, I have sense, such a sense of closeness and love for, for everyone that shares this space. Yeah, a sense of affection for all of you and 
just open this for whatever comes next in the day. A sense of incredible gratitude that I've had this opportunity that somehow in all of the experiences we can have in this wide world that I'm here being part of this, which it's a blessing. And it's so simple to <laughs> to do it. I uh, uh, rather enjoy the thrill. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, mixed with a kind of slight anxiety, I suppose, about. Uh, these meetings because we are really unprogrammed. We're not. We don't have an agenda. You know, uh, we just don't <laughs> see what happens, which is a kind of a bit of a wild ride, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm always thankful about uh, dirt for um, and other people that English is maybe not their you know main language. You all speak English. I'm just so, it, I'm really thankful anyhow that uh, we have voices that are coming from all, all over the planet. Sometimes we have people from India and Thailand and it's just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and there, there is a headless uh, time zone somewhere. I don't know where, but the minutes, 60 minutes are not 60 minutes. That I know for sure. All right, we're going to close. So uh, see you all soon, and thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.